say at the beginning this evening, what a joy it is to be here to worship God with you in spirit and in truth. As I was preparing the lesson for this chapter, it dawned on me that even though I've known for many, many years that Joshua had 24 chapters, I actually did not know what the content of chapter 22 was. And to be honest with you, I was uh, amazed at the story, and I was impressed with the story that is presented to us of the people of Israel in Joshua chapter 22. So we'll continue our series through the books of history this evening uh, by studying this great chapter. And we'll take it as we normally do now, a section at a time as we go through the chapter. Joshua chapter 22. And I've entitled this chapter, uh, The First Worship Controversy. It is here that we are introduced at the end of the chapter to a, a strange altar. An altar that was a memorial to God, but it was not an altar that was intended for sacrifice. And it was an altar that they called witness. I've never heard of naming an altar, much less the idea of naming <coughs> one witness. Or if you have uh, some versions, it will be named E or Ed as uh, your particular version may be. That word means witness. So Joshua chapter 22, beginning in verse 1, we read that Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, uh, commanded you, and you have obeyed my voice and all that I commanded you. You have not let your... Brethren, left your brethren these many days up to this day, but you kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren as he promised them. Now therefore, return and go to your tents and to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of Jordan. But take careful heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul. It seems like the Lord himself quoted this passage of scripture when he gave a very similar command to those who would follow him many years later. So what's going on here? The seven years of war had ended. The land of Canaan, the promised land, has been conquered. It has been divided. The land is being settled as we uh, continue through this chapter, through this story. We find the land is at peace. It was divided among the tribes, but there was more work to do, much more work to do, on both sides of the Jordan River. So Joshua assembled the army. And in that assembly, and the purpose of that assembly was to dissemble the army. It's funny that he called them together to break them apart. But that's exactly what he did. He brought, called them together so that he could formally and officially and publicly send the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh back to the other side of Jordan, these two and a half tribes, on the Transjordan, or the eastern side, where their home was. This contingent started out with 40,000 men, 40,000 fighting men. We don't know how many made it lost in the battles. We don't know how many survived the seven years of fighting. Uh, they may have died in fighting. They may have died from disease. They may have died from old age. We just are not certain about that. But we find in this passage uh, a fourfold commendation where Joshua says, You've kept all that the Lord commanded you by Moses. Even though the respected leader Moses was gone, they remained faithful to their pledge. What a testimony for us today. They remained faithful. They were men of their word. This seems to be a great theme in and of itself for them. Uh, all that we would keep all the Lord's commandments and in doing so, of course, keep our word today. Verse 2, Joshua also says, You have obeyed 
my voice in all that I commanded you. They obeyed every commandment that Moses gave them and every commandment that Joshua gave them during the campaign. In other words, these men weren't rabble rousers. They weren't uh, divisive. They were there to work and there to labor with their brethren. Verse 3, Joshua said, You have not left your brethren to fight alone these many days, actually seven years. I didn't do the math to figure that out, but that's several thousand days. You have kept charge, number four, of the commandment of the Lord. Here, too, is the record of their honorable discharge. There was a reward for their faithfulness. Their reward was they reached the end. They're, they're able to be discharged with pride and honor because they've done all that they were supposed to do. And so the scripture says that God gave them rest and peace. Though they were the first in line for the battle, they were the last actually to begin to enjoy their possession that God had given them. Their commitment had been fulfilled and satisfied. Even at this stage, we, in the scriptures, we begin to learn the adage, it's become an adage or an old saying now, that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. The Lord really emphasized that in his teaching. Joshua sent them away with blessing and recognition for all of their valiant deeds. And he gave them a loving admonition. This isn't getting on to them. He's not fussing at them. He's exhorting them or encouraging them to be faithful to God's commandment. He says to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, and to cleave to him, or to serve him with their whole heart and soul. One can't obey God without loving him. That is possible. I want to tell you, though, one cannot love God without obeying him. It just doesn't work that way. Walking in God's ways requires keeping the commandments. We hear a lot of fuss today about preachers, preachers who preach about commandment keeping. Well, it is necessary if we love God for us to keep his commandments always and in all conditions we are to cleave to him at all points loyalty loyally serving him just as they did and the, just as the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh did <clears throat> Joshua gave the uh, now demobilized soldiers uh, exhortation to do all of these things. This is positive encouragement, positive commands. And so should we also devote ourselves wholeheartedly and exclusively to being involved in the interests of God and his kingdom. Folks, this is the only way, the only way to find true peace and true rest in our society, in our day today. Beginning in verse 6. Joshua blessed them and went and sent them away, and then went to their tents. Now to the half-tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession in Bashan. But to the other half of it, Joshua gave a possession among their brethren on this side, on the west side of Jordan. <clears throat> and indeed, when Joshua sent them away to their tents, he blessed them and spoke to them, saying, Return you with much riches to your tents, with very much livestock, with silver and gold, with bronze, with iron, and with very much clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies among with your brethren. So the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the land, country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, which they had obtained according to the Lord, according to the word of the Lord, by the hand of Moses. Now Gad and Manasseh, or Manasseh was one of the children of Joseph. So this man's, this tribe's allotment was already uh, somewhat less, it seems, than what the others were. Manasseh was the only tribe to receive two inheritances, one in each on each side of the River Jordan. They're the only tribe to receive one of each, uh, an inheritance or a parcel of ground on each side of the Jordan. Verse 7 describes one half 
of the tribe received an inheritance from Moses, and the other half received an inheritance from Joshua. Uh, I can only imagine in my mind's eye that there was a lot of sorrow as well as anticipation at this division of the army. These men had fought together, had lived together, they suffered together very much for many, many years. And now they were dividing themselves and now they were going their separate ways. Joshua gave four commandments uh, to these people. Return to your tents, to the land of your possession. Number two, take diligent heed to do the commandments and the law, to love the Lord and to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments. Cleave to him and serve him with all your heart and soul. Number three, return with much riches to your homes. And he lists uh, some of the things that they were able to take as, as spoil from the battle. Cattle, silver, gold, brass, iron, clothes. And Joshua said, finally, divide your share of the spoil among the brethren. Though through Moses, the Lord had granted them position to remain east of Jordan. And now this tribe was returning home. They were going home. In verse 10 through 12, we read that they came to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan. The children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an altar there by the Jordan, a great, impressive altar. Now, I think that when the scripture calls something impressive, it's going to be pretty impressive. Now the children of Israel, this is the nine and a half tribes on the, that remained on the west side of, of the Jordan in the land of Canaan, heard someone say, Behold, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region of the Jordan on the children of Israel's side. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered together at Shiloh to go to war against them. I want you to notice several things in this passage of scripture here. First of all, notice that the tribes on the east side of Jordan were not at this point considered as part of the nation. They were about to go to war. And they weren't consulted in this preparation for war. Uh, they called each other brethren, though. Even though they weren't part of the same congregation, they called each other brethren. But they were separated now by a choice that the two and a half tribes on the Transjordan, on the eastern side, made long ago before the death of Moses. Notice, too, that the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered at Shiloh to go to war against them based on hearsay. Based on the report, it doesn't seem like it was a major report. It doesn't seem like there was many, many witnesses to this great altar. They just heard about it, and they were ready to go fight. It's good that there were some cooler heads involved in this, or else they would have destroyed each other. This misunderstanding, is what I've chosen to call it, almost caused a civil war this early in the land of Israel. There's no doubt a lack of wisdom on the part of the two and a half tribes, of the, of the Transjordan tribes. They were, they in their angst of leaving their brethren, uh, and in remembrance of their sweet fellowship that they had enjoyed previously, probably decided to erect this altar as a memorial. That's probably the reasoning behind it. And I've often wondered if this word altar was poorly translated. Uh, in this passage of scripture if it could have been better translated as memorial I, I couldn't find any evidence for that so we'll just have to leave it there the altar was large it was large enough to see for miles around large enough for the scriptures to call impressive so the western tribes freshly done with war newly at peace armed themselves again very quickly and went after their own brother. They were well aware of the law, which taught against association at all of any with any kind of an idol. That was the reason for them being so provoked. Their alarm was justified. 
The leaders knew how strict the law was and how God frowned upon association with idol worship. That law required them to offer, offer all of their sacrifices in the place that God would choose. And we're going to talk about that more in a little bit. And nowhere else. They appropriately thought this may have been an affront to the choice that God had made of a place to put his name. In other words, Shiloh at this time. It was certainly not a far-fetched leap to uh, infer from the building of an altar an intention to offer sacrifice on it. Sacrifice that would not have been accepted. It would have been will worship. It would have been vain. It would have been false because it's not where God told them to worship. If this were the intent, then it's just a short step to full-scale idolatry and apostasy. We should remember that God is a jealous God. He's jealous for his own institutions. And we should be jealous of it also. So we should oppose anything and everything that looks like or leads to false worship. The zeal of the Western tribes for the purity of faith that was delivered to them at Sinai was commendable. I find no fault with the Western tribes. They considered this apostasy. They considered this treachery, the greatest treachery that could be done to God. It was an affront to God. And they were willing to put their lives on the line in defense of the altar of God, in defense of true worship. They were ready to use force if no other method availed. We see that for these nine and a half tribes, faith was thicker than blood. And in the face of idolatry, they had a short memory. They very quickly, very easily forgot how close they had been because it looks like their brethren were going into idol worship. If these two and a half tribes turned to serve other gods, they were going to be treated as enemies, and they were going to be annihilated. Their previous favor and their previous fervor notwithstanding. They had only recently sheathed their swords, the whole nation of Israel, and they had just barely entered into the rest. Even though they were weary from fighting at this point, no doubt hurting over the departure of these two and a half tribes, and confused by these reports, they were ready to go back to war rather than tolerate idolatry or be lacking in their duty to restrain, repress, and revenge any step of rebellion. It's the same for us today. When we begin to see our brothers fall, we need to move with haste to stop them before it's too late. We can't tolerate error. We can't tolerate sin. We can't tolerate compromise. It's better to get it out of the way than to allow it to become entrenched. Now, you know the rest of the story concerning Israel. You could easily say that if only the succeeding generations had continued in this zealousness, in this zeal. Sadly, they didn't. <sighs> James Burton Kaufman, a popular commentary and a leading scholar, said that there is no reason a lot of critics have, have taken this chapter and this story and blown it out of proportion and made it to be a, a reason to doubt the authorship of Joshua and to doubt the inspiration of the books of history as a whole, but especially the book of Joshua. <coughs> Mr. Kaufman said in response to this accusation of these scholars, critical scholars, that there is no reason for excising this chapter from the Word of God, for labeling it as they have a late priestly addition. If you read those words or hear those words, you can immediately dismiss that concept because it's not so. No textual evidence exists what, whatsoever uh, to put scissors like that on the scriptures. The only reason for the critical attacks against this chapter is that it destroys one of their darling theories, namely that God's command to worship at the central sanctuary was not valid 
from the very beginning. In other words, they say that that command didn't come into practice until Solomon's time, when Solomon built the temple. But it was a law that came to pass. I jumped ahead and, and didn't read. This theory is incorrect. It's founded upon two errors, namely, that a plurality of sanctuaries does not seem to be frowned upon in the Old Testament prior to, uh, to uh, Josiah's reforms about 621 B.C. So this is much after uh, Solomon, Josiah was, and way before Solomon, there was room for multiple places of worship. One man based, uh, based a rather timid statement on the theory of Deuteronomy 12, verses 1 through 5, where it says that uh, that passage forbids worship anywhere except the place where Jehovah God, your, Jehovah your God, shall choose out of all of your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation you shall seek, and hither thou shalt come. This, critical, this criticism uh, says that the only place that God ever selected was Jerusalem. And this is a gross mistake. God selected Shiloh. And before that, he selected a different place. Right here in Joshua, God chose to place his name in the temple in Shiloh. And throughout the history of Israel, from the beginning of, of Israel to the end, all the way back into Abraham's time, we see that the place of worship was in a constant flux, was in a constant mood. So the idea of one central sanctuary where God would dwell among his people and where their sacrifices would be offered is the dominating theme. It's necessary to point out a parallel in our dispensation. God only accepts worship from one place. Not one physical place. Only accepts worship. God only accepts New Testament worship from the New Testament church. Worship is to only be done in this assembly. We can praise God. We should. We can pray to God. We should. We must. We can have Bible study. We can meditate. We can sing. We can even be in the spirit as John was on the Isle of Patmos. But friends, that's not worship. Worship consists of the congregation coming together and doing acts that are obedient to the scriptures to form as worship. As John, uh, <coughs> worship is only acceptable in the assembly. The other prime mistake underlying this critical theory is that Solomon's temple was the one and only goal in that everything was pointed forward to Solomon's temple. That's not the case at all. Everything was pointed forward to Jesus Christ. Solomon's temple was done by permission. Um, it was the tabernacle that God gave Israel, not the temple. The temple was David's idea. And although God accommodated it, God Almighty destroyed it twice. From its beginning, it proved to be a hindrance. We're talking about the temple and a roadblock to the true will of God. It was that temple, really, if you think about it, that crucified the Son of God. It was that temple and all of its constructs that caused or led to the crucifixion. Let's get back to the chapter. Begin in verse 13. Then the children of Israel sent Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, to the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh to the land of Gilead. And with him, with him sent ten rulers, one from each of the chief house, one each, one ruler each from the chief house of every tribe of Israel. And each one of them, each one was the head of his house of his father among the divisions of Israel. Then they came to the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, and to the half tribe of Manasseh to the land of Gilead, and they spoke with them, saying, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What treachery is this that you have committed against the God, the, the God of Israel, to turn away this day from, the, from following the Lord, in that you have built for yourselves an altar, that you might rebel this day against the Lord? 
Is the iniquity of pure not enough for us, from which we are not cleansed until this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord? But that you must turn away this day from following the Lord, and it shall be, if you rebel this day against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. So stop right there. This is uh, uh, Phineas speaking. Uh, you might call this Phineas's sermon, one of the few sermons we have from a priest in the Old Testament. And he's kind of really, he's really getting after it. Uh, he reminds them of the, of the embarrassment at Peor, where Israel sinned with the people of Moab, and how God sent a plague among them. The story is told there in that uh, history of a man taking a Moabite woman and publicly uh, having intercourse with her. And in order to stop the plague, Phineas took a sword from his side and went and pierced both of them, killed both of them on the spot. And because of Phineas's actions, the plague was stopped. Now, Phineas has reminded the children of Reuben and Gad Manasseh of those incidents. And he's not done yet. Begin it in verse 19. Nevertheless, if the land of your possession is unclean, then cross over to the land of the possession of the Lord, where the Lord's tabernacle stands, and take possession among us. But do not rebel against the Lord, nor rebel against us, by building yourselves an altar besides the altar of the Lord our God. Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing? And wrath fell on the congregation of Israel. And that man of God did not perish, and that man did not perish alone in his iniquity. He reminds them of the sin of Achan, and how Achan was punished, and his family were completely wiped out. So here's what's happened. A committee of ten tribal leaders and Phineas, the high priest, the son of, the, of, the, of Eliezer, the grandson of uh, Aaron, were dispatched to the Transjordan tribes to challenge the construction of this altar. They weren't going to make peace. They were going to make war. That was their purpose. Their purpose was to confront, confound, and destroy the evil work. Phineas' zeal for God had already been demonstrated in the incident of uh, at Baal Peor in Numbers 25. This man didn't comprehend compromise. He didn't know what that word meant. Phineas was the man who, uh, who would deal with sin and deal with it quickly. The one selected to accompany Phineas was one leader from each tribe. So in this manner, God chose to govern the people's reaction with wisdom and meekness. The prudence of this tribe, of these tribes, was commendable. God had appointed, in Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 12, if you hear someone in one of your cities which the Lord your God gives you to dwell in, saying, corrupt men have gone out from among you and have enticed the inhabitants of their city, saying, let us go and serve other gods which you have not known, then you shall inquire, search out, and ask diligently. And if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination was committed among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of the city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it, all that is in it, and its livestock with the edge of the sword. First thing that the investigators did was this altar that's built at, at Shiloh, or, or at, the, at the River Jordan, just just before they crossed over into their own country. They issued the charges that were brought against them. They left no ground uncovered about what was, what was going on. There was no confusion here. Building an al another altar was a trespass against God and was equal to the rebellion of soldiers against their captain. This was just like the sin of Baal Peor, which caused the death of 24,000 people in one day. This incident took place not far, uh, this altar incident that we're talking about tonight took place not far from where that slaughter was. All of this was in a manner of speaking self-preservation. That's why these 10 tribes went prepared for war. 
because if they didn't destroy it, God would move against them, and again, 25, 30, 40,000 would be slain by the hand of the Lord. Phineas even went so far as to offer them a part of the inheritance of their own possessions. He said if this altar was built to purge the land that they were to inherit, they could go ahead and join their brothers in Canaan. They could forsake what they had chosen on the, west, on the eastern side of Jordan and join the Canaanite tribes. Phineas pled with the people to not persist in their rebellion. And he further reminded them of Achan who committed a trespass and a swift and thorough punishment. Many lessons can be learned from this chapter. But I think the number one concept here is that a failure to rebuke sin is equal to partaking in sin. A failure to rebuke sin is equal to partaking in sin. Beginning in verse 21. <clears throat> the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said to the heads of the divisions of Israel, The Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods. He knows, and let Israel itself know, if it is in rebellion, or if it is in treachery against the Lord, do not save us this day. If we have built ourselves an altar to turn from following the Lord, or to offer on it burnt offerings, or grain offerings, or to offer peace offerings on it, let the Lord himself require an account. But in fact, we have done it for fear. For a reason, saying, In time to come, your descendants may speak to our descendants, saying, What have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a border between you and us. <clears throat> you children of Reuben and children of Gad, you have no part in the Lord. So your descendants will make our descendants cease fearing the Lord. Therefore, we said, Let us now prepare to build ourselves an altar. Not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between you and us that our generations after us, that we may inform, perform the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings, with our sacrifices, with our peace offerings, that your descendants may not say to our descendants in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. Therefore we said that it will be when they say this to us, to our generation, in time to come, that we would say, here is the replica of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, though not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between you and us. Far be it from us that we would rebel against the Lord and turn from following the Lord this day to build an altar for burnt offerings, for great offerings, for sacrifices, besides the altar of the Lord our God, which is before his tabernacle. The eastern tribes, the Transjordan tribes, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they weren't intimidated by the boldness and the accusatory tone uh, and the charges that were made against them. This boldness, this courage, comes from innocence. This innocence allowed them to maintain a kind and gentle spirit in the face of false and harsh charges. They were able to present a soft answer from a pure heart that turns away wrath. They did not become angry with the committee from the West that was investigating them, nor did they question the jurisdiction of the committee. There was no challenge at all to their authority. These accused tribes pled to God to verify what they were about <clears throat> to say in the investigations. Their first priority was to glorify God. Get that. Their first priority was to glorify God. This was, you might say, a confession of faith. Purposed to remove suspicion. Basically, they recognized God as supreme and praiseworthy. They followed by saying, if we have done anything wrong, let God judge. We know he is omnipresent, and we cannot take anything from him. Plus, we know that he is a jealous God, and we're confident in his judgment. 
They also demonstrated a regard for the opinion of their brothers concerning themselves. By being willing to give an explanation of their actions, they showed their concern for unity. Then they explained their real purpose for building this altar. They said it's not for burnt, for sacrifice. It was simply intended as a replica of the truth to serve as a memorial and a pledge of communion with their brethren. This was a monument to the unity of the nation. This served as a reminder of their previous bond. How very similar. I can't help but think. And every time I think about it, I have goosebumps. This is so similar to the memorial that we observe in our day and time. The memorial of the Lord's Supper. As a monument or a memorial. As a point of unity for the Lord's people today. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 16 and 17. The copy of the Shiloh altar, that's what this was, it was a copy of the Shiloh altar, was an evidence of the Easterners' right to the privilege of the original altar. The newly constructed altar was really a monument celebrating the spiritual unity that tribes on both sides of the River Jordan had. The Eastern tribes had every intention of continuing to worship God properly in his sanctuary, the tabernacle. The large altar had even been modeled, modeled after the altar that was in the tabernacle and thus was another expression of the loyalty to God. The Eastern tribes expressed their horror at the uh, actions which their, they expressed their horror that their actions which were pure in motive were construed as evil. They knew that to offer sacrifices at any unauthorized uh, location constituted serious rebellion against God. So their defense concluded with this disavowal of any intent, evil intent, to undermine the Shiloh altar. They were saying, we value greatly, we esteem greatly that altar. We venerate that altar for the Lord God at Shiloh as much as any other tribes in Israel. And they firmly expressed their resolve to remain loyal to it. We're drawing close to the end of the chapter here. Beginning in verse 30. Now Phineas, the priest and the rulers of the congregation, the heads of the divisions of Israel who were with him, heard the words that the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the children of Manasseh spoke. It pleased them. The Phineas, the son of Eleazar the priest, said to the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the children of Manasseh, This day we perceive that the Lord is among us, because you have not committed this treachery against the Lord. Now you have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord, and Phineas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and the rulers returned from the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, from the land of Gilead to the land of Canaan to the children of Israel, and brought back word with them. So the thing pleased the children of Israel, and the children of Israel blessed God, 